You know, it's really a treat when you see your friends here on the stage at the Creekside. Akira has been a friend of Gray Fox, Winterhawk, for a really long time. He is so busy around here. He's been working with the Bluegrass Academy for Kids over the years. I, you know, I don't know anybody that isn't Akira's friend. Um, you may know him from his work with a band called Bluegrass 45. Okay? A really great uh, musician and, like I said before, a great friend of uh, Bluegrass and Gray Fox. And uh, we're going to have a little discussion today, and it's going to be moderated by Tim Kruzik. Tim is um, a friend of DC Bluegrass, and I guess if he's a friend of DC music, uh, DC Bluegrass music, which is really where the seldom scene really took root, was in the DC area pretty much. Um, if you're a friend there, then you've got to be a friend here, right? We're really happy to have him here to talk about a really nice new release that's getting accolades all over the world that Akira was instrumental in putting together, and it's called Epilogue. It's a tribute to Jim Duffy, and they're going to tell you all about it. Please welcome our friends, Akira Atsuka. Atsuka? How, how? Akira, I did, I did mean to. I practiced and everything. It's Akira, everybody. Thank you, thank you. And Tim, and Tim Krusik. Thank Welcome you. them. Down there. Man, thank you all for coming out. This is great. Hey, we're here to celebrate really two things in my mind. One is uh, John Duffy himself. I, in, in the liner notes, Katie Daly wrote, uh, whenever he played, it was a show, and he was the ringmaster. So we want to, we're going to have some great <laughs> stories about John Duffy. We're going to introduce the folks up here as we go. But uh, I, I think it's a watershed time. Some of the younger folks, it might be uh, less than 22 years old when John died in 96, they would've, wouldn't have been born, don't even know about him or what he did. And Akira and Ronnie Freeland put out this project called Epilogue. It's been a long time coming. And uh, I'm really fortunate that I got to listen to the, the mixes as this thing went through the process all the years. I've been over Akira's house in fact, Akira's been a friend of mine. He was the first real up-close bluegrass musician I saw in 1973, about a couple of months after I got my banjo. He was playing at a band called the Grass Menagerie. And my bona fides, anybody have an A-track player I can find? Um, <laughs> I have... They're coming back. I have the They're Caravan CD of the Bluegrass 45... Back, uh, CD, you know. excuse me. This is CD. The A-track. Yeah. This is the A-track of Caravan. By the way, John Duffy produced this album for the Bluegrass 45. So, anyway, I want uh, Akira to talk some about how he got into bluegrass and got to the United States and how John Duffy became such a big part of his life. And then we're going to talk about different parts of the project. So, Akira, oh. why don't you start us off and tell us a little bit about bluegrass right. in Japan and the 45 and what got you here? So glad to see a lot of John Duffy fans here. I started playing mandolin around 63 or 64 in Japan. And of course, I listened to Bill Monroe and Ronnie Reno and other people. But when I heard Duffy with a country gentleman, it was just, it was right to me. Bill Monroe was hard to figure it out. But when I heard John, it was like, I like this. And <clears throat> I found That's John. Uh, he says there's no bourbon in my toddy bottle. <laughs> I, I believe that would be a whiskey sour. Who, who oh, yeah, owns, pardon me. Who owns the little hand? The little I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Show nice does. Sorry. Anyway, um, John was my hero when I was trying to learn mandolin. And I was lucky enough to uh, be invited to come to the States in 71 by Dick Freeland, who owned Rebel Records back then. And when we got into D.C., first night, Dick said, yeah, John and Nancy Duffy are coming over for dinner. I'm like, yeah, sure, right. <laughs> they really showed up. I was ready to, uh, maybe I'll, I should not say that. I will. We, Oh, please. <laughs> you'll, you'll say anything. I'm not afraid. Anyway, we had hot dogs and burgers, and then we started playing. And Bluegrass 45 was so scared of John. I mean, he was a hero, especially for me. Anyway, we played, and 
John would say, let's do Bluebirds are Swinging. A banjo player, Sabu, would kick it off just like Eddie Aragog did. And I would play John's break just like he recorded back in 62 or something. I think we impressed him a little bit. <laughs> Five boys from Japan knew everything about country gentlemen. <laughs> and in September, we did this LP for Dick Phelan, second LP for Rebel. And uh, Dick thought maybe it would be good to have John Duffy produce the album. And I'm glad we did. He played. He gave us songs like, What Am I Doing Hanging Around? Even though he recorded it again with a solo scene just a few months later. Or oh, he played cymbal on one tune. We had a great time together. Anyway, I moved over here in 73. By the time he had a solo scene going on, I used to go and see him every Thursday night at Red Fox Inn in Bethesda. Um, he passed away in 96. And Dick Freeland's son, Ronnie Freeland, I met him in 1970 when they came to Japan. He was 11 years old, but we became good friends. And later on, yeah, he became a great recording engineer. We were coming back from IBMA uh, in Louisville, and Ronnie says, we got to do that album. Which album? I told you this. I don't remember. John Duffy tribute album. Hey, that's a great album, but you didn't tell me that. Yes, I did. No, I did not. <laughs> anyway, at the end of that year, 2002, we had the first session, and then uh, we went back to IBMA in 2003 and recorded uh, James King, Ron Stewart, David Greer, uh, Todd Phillips, and all these people. And then uh, we had to fly to Nashville to record Jerry and John Cowan. And we flew up, uh, drove up to Connecticut and recorded Phil Rosenthal. And uh, it was a long time coming, but we had so much time, so much fun time recording it. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, DC scene there for a second because you mentioned uh, going to see the the seldom seen. The Red Fox Inn was, was quite a place in the Birchmere, and uh, I thought maybe uh, Kitsy could give us a story about John to talk a little bit about his character. It doesn't have to be about the Red Fox or anything, but That's that was... good. I never went there. You didn't go you to the Fox? Went there? I went to the Birchmere. I'm a Virginia girl. Wow. <laughs> Don't mess with me. <laughs> well, I, I went both ways then, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. That sounds no. like what John was saying. <laughs> well, I, I met John um, when he was playing with the country gentleman. And, uh, but then, really, I got to be friends with him when the seldom scene started. And I, uh, uh, there are people that aren't in this crowd but live in Virginia used to call me the Pearl Mest of Great Falls, Virginia, because I had a big home, and uh, uh, we had huge parties there all the time, which Akira attended, and uh, Ronnie too. D Duffy really didn't like to go to parties. He really wasn't interested, but on occasion he would come, and, and so I got to know him pretty well, and Nancy, and uh, uh, we had good times together. Uh, and then my husband died, and uh, somewhere along the line, Mr. Pete Kuykendall decided Oh, I'm sorry. He just died. I can't. All right, I'm going to say it. I'll do it. I can do it. Anyhow, for some reason he liked me, and I, I uh, started dating him, and I really got to know John very well. And so it was a wonderful experience. And uh, they shared a special interest between the two of them because John was married to Marion, and then they had Ginger, who is Rick Aldred's wife, and then... Marion married Pete, and he and uh, and then Pete married me. Are you this following is, all this? this <laughs> She's her own grandma. Bluegrass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's the uh, National Enquirer side of uh, John Duffy, no, right there. <laughs> another thing is, Pete's first wife was uh, 
Oh, Anne. Anne Hill. She co-wrote a bunch of songs with John Duffy. Like, it's a, I, I believe Bringing Mary Home yeah, or Christmas Time Back Home. A bunch of them, yeah. It was a small world back then. Now it's a big world. But anyhow, I really enjoyed John's company. We had a lot of fun together. He liked to tease me a lot, and, uh, I, and I could tease him right back. So we had a good time. That, that's how I really first met John and got to know him, and I was honored. Very good. Thank you. Um, this gentleman over here is Ron Thomason. You might know him from the Dry Branch Fire Squad, the host of the Gray Fox Yay! Festival. He's, he seems to be the first at a lot of things. You know, it's kind of funny, when, when I was a young pup back not too long after I was talking about seeing Akira, um, Katie Daly, who was a DJ on WAMU in Washington, I'd listen to all the, the shows, and you did a live show on WAMU with somebody, and I never even heard of the Dry Branch Fire Squad, but this is the you guy... You missed a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John, John was an icon the way he led the band. He had a certain way of fronting the band, and anybody that's ever seen the Dry Branch Fire Squad knows this is one unique guy, and that everybody loves the Dry Branch Fire Squad and the way he leads them. <laughs> so, an interesting thing was... Uh, he was the very first person to record on this project. He came in. The, Akira and Ronnie set up their room down at IBMA when it was in Louisville. They had all Ronnie's equipment, and they invited people in. And this was the first guy they invited in, and he was singing on some of the, the tracks there. And uh, thought, Ron, you might give us some, some insight into John Duffy's character and maybe if he John's even impacted. John's character, yes. I have some <laughs> things to say about John's character. Thank you very much for calling on me. <laughs> so, I loved John Duffy. I truly did. I wish I could have dated him. Uh, <laughs> and he got me out of a lot of top, tough spots. And uh, I, I don't think people knew the... He always seemed so gruff, didn't he? Like he... Like, like he was going to nail the sound man's hand onto the board so he didn't. <laughs> and he had a hammer just to prove it. But uh, when I got my mandolin back in 1978, it was a big event in my life. I had traded an apartment house for it. And I remember telling people not too many years after that, that's when you could still get a mandolin like that for just one apartment house. <laughs> <laughs> and so the first... The first show we played after I had gotten it, and I was all excited and everything, and John came up and said, I heard you got one of those special mandolins, you know. And I said, yeah, I was all excited. I said, why don't you play it and everything, and it sounded just like John Duffy when he did, and I thought, well, that's just the way it's supposed to go. I wonder if it'll ever sound like that for me. And then I laid it down that very day, leaned it up on, on a stage, and I got, picked up my guitar to play a song, and the wind blew it over oh. and broke the curl off the neck. Oh, man. And John so Duffy sad. came around. I mean, he, he had a way of knowing how that would make you feel. And uh, he said, let me fix that mandolin for you. And I said, well, John, you know, I, I really can't part with it. He said, I'll have it fixed by the next set. <laughs> I said, there's no way you have a fix by the next day. He said, look, I built a mandolin with nothing but glue and magic markers. <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was so nervous, I didn't even know what part of my mandolin was made of magic markers. <laughs> but true story, by the second set, John Duffy came back and that curl was glued back on that mandolin. And if you ever seen the back of one of them, they're all black. And, and he had taken a magic marker <laughs> and blackened in where he had fixed the mandolin. And it's still there, people. Anybody doubts it, it was still there. But let me just, I don't want to keep your time. There's so many people that, that knew John so well. But I, I have two or three favorite stories, but this is my favorite one. And I think this captures his character more than anything. Evidently, I'm kind of accident prone. 
<laughs> this is my 24th broken bone, but I think most of them all came from horse accidents. And uh, so one time I had a really bad horse accident where I had to bandage up my whole head. <laughs> so literally, I'd gotten home from the hospital. I, I didn't know anybody would know about this or anything, and I'd, I'd broken a shoulder, and, but mostly I'd had my head all messed up. I didn't even know how bad it was going to be. And so the phone rings, and my wife at the time, <laughs> <laughs> she knew how to answer a phone. I ain't kidding. And uh, it was a good thing one of us did. <laughs> She came in, she said, uh, John Duffy on the phone. And of course, I didn't believe it, but it wasn't anything I could say. <laughs> but I had this little pad she'd give me to write on. I wrote out best I could. I said, tell him I can't talk. She goes back to the phone, comes back and says, he says he doesn't want you to talk. He wants you to listen. <laughs> So I'll go through life knowing, even when I couldn't talk, John Duffy would talk to me. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Ron. I think you saw in the program that uh, Tim O'Brien was going to join us, and we were hoping that he would, but I, I believe some things have gone on that have caused him to rehearse with the band, and he couldn't be here at the moment. So sad to say that I don't think he's going to join us this afternoon, but he was on uh, a couple of tracks on the album and d does a great Tim O'Brien singing. I uh, want to move down to the end here. I, I, f I first saw you at, at the Birchmere with Boone Creek, you know. His, <laughs> his time goes way back to a country gentleman. You that know? could figure into my story as well. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> you remember a band uh, called Coup de Grass? Yes. <laughs> Remember, I remember their album cover. I was, yeah. I was, no, I was there. Who was with, you were? Yeah, oh. after, after the Birchmere. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. <laughs> blanket apology. Yeah, we had a good time. Mm -hmm. um, he's Jerry Douglas, the great Jerry Douglas. Thank you. He, he's on uh, three tracks on, on the album and did some pretty special stuff, and I'm going to ask Kira to ask a question about that. But before we get there, I just want to give you an open mic to uh, share some <laughs> of your wit. <laughs> yeah, it won't last long. <laughs> um, you know, Ron said something about, uh, about John that, that not a lot of people know, is that he, he could come off as gruff, and you know he could he was not the guy that you wanted to uh hecklers <laughs> bad idea john could put them in their place so fast you know like, i'm getting paid to be an asshole up here okay <laughs> you know things like that you know but it you know i'm sorry other kids in here it's going to get worse but um but he was this really sweet guy, so so sweet, and uh, and every time I talked to him, I mean, I had such great respect for him. I I used to go to Berryville, uh, Virginia, and see the festivals from like 1968 on. I was there. I was a little kid, and I was there. My dad would well, take his vacations from the steel mill, and we they all revolved around July the fourth and being in Berryville, Virginia, Watermelon Park. And uh, being at these festivals, and I remember I have pictures that I took of the country gentlemen all coming off of from across the road, all coming off of a hill, and and uh, I don't know what they were doing up there. I mean, the four of them didn't really like hanging out together that much, but they were all they were all coming down the hill, and uh, and and I took pictures of them, and <laughs> I gave J Duffy one of them later on, and he said. What the hell were we doing up there? And I said, I, I didn't go. I thought about going up to see, but I didn't. You know, you'll be happy to know. But they were, they were. You know, I had pictures of them like trying, you know, trying to get across a barbed wire fence and stuff like it. It's like, I guess I'm a stalker, really. But that was when I was uh, 12 years old. And I've gotten a lot better at it. Uh, but, <clears throat> but uh, he, he was a wonderful man, and, uh, and I remember I was in, in Dublin, Ireland, uh, working on a record in, uh, in December of 96 when, uh, when, when 
Duffy died. And I just sat down and cried. It was just, uh, I'd lost a piece of my childhood. I'd lost a friend, uh, so many things. And, uh, but he, he was a, a gruff uh, human being, but that was only his stage thing. I mean, he'd walk in the back door of the Birchmere or, or the Red Fox and with his little, this little box, you know, it looked like uh, you, you carried harmonicas in it or something, but it was to mix his drinks. <laughs> um, he had a mandolin case in one hand and this drink case in the other hand, and I'm wondering who has the drink case because I'd love to have it. <laughs> uh, no, I don't drink, but I just like to have it. But, um, uh, <laughs> okay, God, oh, this is terrible. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll get to that later. I'll wait. I've got, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> you'll see. But I, but I, I uh, remember having dinner with him in, in Lexington, Kentucky. We were both playing the Festival of the Bluegrass there. And, uh, and and I went to went to went with him and and to the restaurant and he ordered a steak like he always ordered he ordered a steak and I understand he he would eat a dozen eggs for breakfast every day, I mean so this guy was going to explode at some point right, anyway but uh, so the steak came and he he took the salt shaker and he started salting the steak and talking to me, you know, it was just <laughs> like and he and I went oh, John. That's not really too that good for you, you know, to to do that to your steak. And he said, "What?" You know, it's like <laughs> you pretty much shut up, you know. So so he did that, and I imagine he did that a lot. And 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 uh, that, that don't do that. But uh, but he he was a really sweet man and was always so nice to me and liked the idea that I played the dobro because he really loved playing dobro. And, uh, and I, uh, Bill Emerson told me a story one time about when they were playing in the, in the, uh, in the, what, what, what was it? Uh, Shamrock? it's a Shamrock in uh, Georgetown in the early, early days of the country gentleman. And, and I played in there later on. And I remember they had a sign on one of the mic stands that said, yes, we have cold duck. <laughs> yeah. That was like a big deal. And, uh. <laughs> and that's the kind of place they were playing, and um, but it was a big deal in those days. But uh, Bill Emerson told me that his his brother he had a big brother, and and this guy was huge, and, and you know there were the Yates brothers who who beat up eighteen cops in Georgetown one time uh, before they got were thrown into a cop car. But there were also the Emerson brothers who uh, were equally mean, and. Uh, and John said he, he, he picked up the dobro and he played a song on the dobro and he put it down and <laughs> he went back to the mandolin and he, he, and he came back to, you know, he played for a while, played mandolin, Charlie and, and uh, Eddie and John and Tom Gray. And uh, then he went back to, to go get the dobro again and Emerson's brother said, don't pick up that dobro. <laughs> you pick up the dobro one more time, I'll kill you. <laughs> so John left it there. He didn't, and, and it, he just—he was—he was not the guy that you saw on stage privately. He was—he was a sweetheart. He, you couldn't be a kinder man than him. And uh, uh, you know, I regret that I didn't know him better than I did. But I, I would go to the—I would go when John Starling was doing surgery late. I would—they'd uh, call me, and I would go play Mike Aldridge's parts in the seldom scene, and Mike would play guitar and sing lead, and, and it was a completely different, you know, show. But it was still the seldom scene, just slightly shifted. But uh, I had some really good times with Duffy, and he was always funny, and he was, and he was uh, but he was like a Johnny Carson. You've heard of uh, Johnny Carson, like he, as soon as he left the stage, he was not funny. Duffy was not funny, you know, if he wasn't on stage. As soon as he hit the stage, and he had these squirrely pants, you know, that he'd wear. I mean, it's all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, I just, uh, I just think he was wonderful, and and especially at the that point where the seldom seen kind of exploded. And I thought, well, that's it. I guess that's it. But he and Ben somehow strapped it all back together. And I and I told John, I said, I really admire that you didn't just give up, throw them down, you know. 
And because you could have, he could have walked away at any time, but he didn't. He really loved playing this music, and he was a great guy. He loved fans, especially the hecklers. <laughs> and uh, I, I still miss it. Thanks, Jerry. That's great. Let me jump in. You were talking about eggs, dozen eggs. <laughs> but also he liked bacon. <laughs> you buy the whole package, fix it on the stove, really uh, dry, and then he will take it apart, red meat and grease. <laughs> he will give the red meat to his dogs. <laughs> A white bread, he will put grease. <laughs> And then salt. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What do you mean? Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about the album in a minute, but I, I love your story about the, the drink case because in the later years of the seldom scene, he had like a custom cup holder that yes, he put he on did. the mic stand right that, that always had his whiskey sour in it. That band I mentioned, Coup de Grass, one of the guys lived next door to John and, and said exactly what you did. That He was a very private person. He loved his baseball, loved his bowling, and uh, he was very different this, than from the stage persona. But he still did fire back. I, I was trying to book a gig for my band, and this uh, promoter over on, on the Eastern Shore of Maryland said she had called and asked him if the seldom scene would play. And he said, well, how much? And uh, she said, I've got about $1,500. And he said, well, which two of us would you like? LAUGHTER 